Hi guys and welcome back to another video. Today I am bringing you a review of the Matthew Shardlake series by CJ Sampson. <laughs> This is a seven book series that follows lawyer Matthew Shardlake uh, during the reign of Henry VIII and early reign of Edward VI. And um, it is a murder mystery style story, but is obviously historical fiction. Um, and I, I absolutely adored this series, so I felt the need to do a dedicated review to it. Uh, first off, I'll start with the kind of overall themes of the story. So we do have, as I said, Matthew Shardlake as the protagonist, who is a hunchback lawyer uh, in Tudor, England, and he is a reformer. So for anyone who doesn't know too much about historical or about history, um, we have uh, during the time of Henry VIII, after his separation from uh, the from the papacy, from Rome, and from Catholicism, we have two factions of religion in England. We have the reformers and we have the traditionalists. The reformers are the Protestants and the ones pushing towards Protestantism. And we have the traditionalists who are obviously the ones that lean towards Rome. Now, there are kind of derogatory terms for that as well. You have the Catholics would refer to the reformers as heretics and you have the reformers referring to the traditionalists as papists but overall we have a divided England obviously it's much more complex than that especially if you start factoring in Luther Lutherism uh, if you factor in the Anabaptists there's a lot more to it than that but that's as much as we need to know at the moment so we have Matthew Shardlake who is a reformer and um, he is currently working on a case in this first one. So he works for Thomas Cromwell. For anyone who doesn't know who Thomas Cromwell is, it was a very, very prominent historical figure who basically uh, was the, 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 the one that pushed most towards reform. He was the lead reformist uh, during the separation from Rome, especially during the reign of Anne Boleyn um, and until his own uh, execution a few years later. Um, so in the first two books, we do follow um, Child Lake working for Thomas Cromwell. Spoiler alert, I suppose, for anyone who doesn't know their history, Thomas Cromwell was executed um following the divorce from Anne of Cleves uh so from there we do also uh follow Shard Lake working for Bishop Cranmer Bishop Cranmer is another reformer and he was the head of the English church during uh Tudor times especially following uh his separation from Rome and then we also follow him working for Catherine Parr and then finally working for Elizabeth, later Queen Elizabeth I. So uh, the series has each an individual arc and then uh, certain things that roll through the entire series. So each individual narrative is its own investigation, essentially. So in this first one, for example, we are investigating the peculiar murder of one of the king's... Um, what are they called? Uh, commissioner, that's the one. Uh, so we are following the peculiar murder of one of the commissioners. The commissioners were, during the dissolution of the monasteries, Cromwell especially, had a group of people who went to investigate the monasteries to see if they were viable, to see if they were still upholding the values they were supposed to. This was all a sham. It was literally the entire idea around it was to prove in some way, shape or form that the monastery was not viable and therefore have it closed down, have the financial assets returned to the crown and therefore create more money for the crown. Obviously, um, this one it's a little bit more complex than that but we do see a lot of representation in this book and throughout this series in this first one we get representation for 
homosexuality. We do have a black character, which again would be very unusual to find in Tudor England. Um, we also obviously have disability with the likes of Shardleg having a hunchback. And we also have the way that women were treated during this society. So yeah, this first book was a fantastic start to the series. I am so glad that it kicked off so strong because I, it made me want to read the rest of the series. I'm also very glad that I bought the entire series so I could binge it because it's a very binge worthy series in my opinion. Um, the resolution to the case, it was quite interesting because I guessed who it was. And then it did the whole, oh, okay, maybe it's not. And then it was. <laughs> so that was quite good um but yeah i i really did like the way that this story went and each book also has a different like over overarching theme uh in relation to shardleg so in this first one it makes shardleg question his religious convictions that there isn't a wholly good side there isn't a good side and a bad side it's not just all reformers are good and all traditionalists are bad this one really does make him question his religious values and morals and i think that it does it in a very good way in a very subtle way and in a very intelligent way the thing i can most say about this series is how intelligently written it is we move on to the second book and in this one we are following the case where the ancient greek substance of dark fire has been unearthed and uh thomas cromwell wants it so that he can present it to the king and um it, it has disappeared so he he gets shardleg to go and investigate and discover what has happened to it like to the formula so that they can recreate it and i'm i'm excited to say that the way this went was both it had to end a certain way because of when it's set. If you know anything about history, then obviously there are going to be things that you know how they're going to end, but you don't know how it gets there. So even if you are a historical nerd and you know your history and you're like, well, what? you can't surprise me because it's got real people in it. The whole series has this fantastic thing of taking a real life event and a real life person and making the real life events just make you more concerned for the fictional characters because obviously the fictional characters they don't have a real life fate so, so samson can do what he wants with his characters so the real world stakes actually make you really concerned for the fictional characters and i think that is really well done and very intelligently created that way as i said i'm going to say intelligent about 50 times um, so yeah, this one was another one that was definitely very enthralling and I feel like the main theme for this one is, again, it's more about Charlotte's political views. So we had his religious views in the first one and this one was much more to do with his political views. The third book in which we are following uh, Shardlick is Sovereign and in this one we are... Um, on our way up to York. So Henry VIII has just married... Catherine Howard who is his fourth wife no fifth wife and in this one Catherine Howard um, and Henry VIII are going to be going on a royal progress which is basically like a tour essentially of England to kind of be like by the way I'm your king yeah I'm your king yep we all agreed that I'm your king okay cool let's let's continue about our day and that's basically what he does like he spends like two months wandering around the country being like I'm your king um, and that's sort of royal progress is for want of a better word and it's really expensive as well and um child lake is sent by bishop Cranmer up to york which is a substantially more rebellious area of england it is one of the areas of england that is most discontented with the current circumstances especially the socio-political ones but also the economic ones and um he is sent up there because they are going to be holding essentially like a bring your troubles to the king kind of a court thing but you don't actually bring it to your king you know like so it, go it goes to lawyers and stuff who then deal with it but it's free which you'd normally have to pay for and yeah you literally you just go and you bring your woes to these people financial or legal in some way shape or form and they're like okay well, we'll deal with it and the uh, bishop Cranmer has sent Shardlake up there to deal with these um as one of the 
people who has to deal with the legal side of it and um, he gets roped into a plot to remove the king this one tackles um i think ableism really well the theme for this one is definitely shard lake's like, dysphoria and kind of self-loathing towards his um disability one of the things that i really appreciate about this series when it comes to the disability when it comes to all of the representation as well is that it does not feel like it's thrown in your face at all it feels very apt for the time so for example if you have we have a black character throughout the this i will get into the characters a bit later but we do have a black character throughout the entire series and he his his explanation as to why he is black and in england in tudor times makes perfect sense so i just i really appreciate you know you have gay characters and you have women of various different types you have the wifey type you have the intelligent type you have strong you have evil you have all kinds of women you have all kinds of people and i think that one of the things that cj samson has done best with this series is that he has really really intelligently again um done it in a way that it shows his contemporary convictions and beliefs while simultaneously highlighting the horrific treatment that any minority got during its time but yes, in this one, we do have depictions and questions around ableism and Shard Lake's own image of himself as a disabled man. In book four, we are following Shard Lake as he investigates the murder of one of his friends. There is a series of murders happening throughout the London area, and they are all dying in the way is of the Book of Revelation. So you have someone who is doing religious murders. And in this one, he is also at the same time dealing with a, a court case of his own um, in which a boy has gone essentially insane through religion. So he just all he wants to do is maniacally pray. So he wants to pray for his damned soul um, and therefore it has driven him to insanity. So he doesn't want to eat and he doesn't want to do anything but pray. And it has dri driven him to a form of insanity. And in in this one, therefore, we are tackling a lot of mental health. We are tackling both the mental health the, of Shard Lake through his grief, through losing his friend, the mental health of his patient, because we do actually go into Bedlam Asylum several times throughout this book, meet a couple of the other inmates there, and then the mental health of the serial killer. So this one does definitely tackle mental health, and it tackles it, again, in a balance between the way that it would have been perceived during the time and how horrible that was things like possession get thrown around um, and then simultaneously you can definitely see the author's modern lens taken in as to consideration as well and it's just another one that i think he depicts really well the next book is heartstone and in this one we are in a you know an odd one so in this one catherine parr gets shard lake to investigate a case on behalf of one of her ladies so her lady's son has committed suicide and he committed suicide because he was the tutor to a young boy and girl um whose parents died and then those children got taken into a wardship he wanted to stay on and care for the children which they would not they did not want to adhere to um, and then shortly after the girl dies now in this one we do tackle things quite differently because the case isn't quite as simple it's not just someone's dead sort it out it's it's a lot there's a lot more at stake with this one there's a lot more in play um this was probably my least favorite of the series um basically the my problem with this is that we did have a decent chunk at the beginning of the book where we do just have shard lake kind of wandering around going oh that's interesting huh that's curious and not much can come of it so there's that um so yeah i i do i do feel like this one it, it took me longer to get into still a fantastic read still four stars but the rest of them were five stars so this is actually noticeable dip for me but still a fantastic book like if it were a standalone it would be a fantastic book but in this series it, it did 
um, decline, I suppose, a little. Um, and this book specifically tackles um, Shardake's perspectives on the law as a lawyer and justice and how they do not necessarily equate to the same thing. The next book that we have in the series is Lamentation, which is the story, one of the stories again with Catherine Parr. And in this one, Catherine Parr's book, which is a real historical book, um, Lamentation of a Sinner, which she wrote uh, as what she wrote it while she was married to Henry, but it wasn't actually published until uh, Edward the Sixth reign. But um, in this one, her book goes missing. And in this point, at this point in history, Henry keeps flopping back and forth between leaning more Catholic, leaning more Protestant. He keeps kind of changing his mind. And at this point, he's leaning quite Catholic when this book goes missing, which is obviously very terrifying for very reformist Catherine Parr, who then is concerned that he will off her like he did the rest of his wives. And yeah, she's concerned about this book going missing. There is no record of that actually happening. That's fictional for the story's sake. But um, so it is up to, it's up to Shardlake to go and find the book, find out who stole it and what their intentions are for this book. Um, this one I feel is the one that most, ta that tackles kind of most close to home for Shardlake because this one basically tackles his interpersonal relationships. It tackles a lot of his relationships with the rest of the cast, the recurring cast that we have seen especially, and then also kind of the way he feels about, you know, romance and love and the way he feels about women, etc. And I do very much appreciate the way that this one tackled just people in his life and the way that he does or doesn't treat them, does or doesn't respect them, does or doesn't see them. And I really liked that. And I think that this was definitely one of the more powerful books in that sense, in the sense of connecting with characters. And the last book is Tombland. Tombland in terms of themes is a little bit less direct, it's less it covers this specific theme and it's more a combination of everything that we have seen so far. The rocky foundations for some things that sh that Charlotte does no longer knows what he believes on and completely crumbles them down and rebuilds them way more solidified and it also enhances the things that Charlotte has always been very sure about. So everything that has been brought into question up until this point in the series is now brought to a head in this one and the story for this one is set during Ketz Rebellion. Ketz Rebellion for those of you who are not historically inclined is a rebellion that happened with Northern England um, wanting to demand more rights demand, or not even more rights just more financial security there were people literally dying from starvation in northern england during this time it is during the protectorate of the duke of somerset over king edward the sixth and yeah it's there were a lot of factors to it but essentially it is that northern england was just so destitute and they wanted to be heard and they wanted help from the crown and they started a rebellion um, and Sade at this point was investigating uh, for Elizabeth a crime where a distant relative of hers has been murdered on her Berlin side and then it turns out that he's just stuck there during the Ketz Rebellion because he's in Norwich, no, in Norfolk at the time. This again, five star read, fantastic, fantastic book. Now C.T. Sampson has been diagnosed with terminal cancer so it is highly likely that this will be the last book in the series and i'm not okay with that because the way this ended was so bittersweet so gut-wrenchingly bittersweet that it, although it's a fantastic ending i just i need <laughs> i need a little bit more happiness <laughs> than the than the bitter sweetness of this one but it is a fantastic ending to the series regardless and I again five stars I think that this was the most powerful book in the series I think that this was just so strong and so impactful and it was absolutely phenomenal now for the series as a whole I'd like to dive into some of the characters for a second because the recurring characters in this are absolutely fantastic a, obviously you have Matthew Shardlake, who is the protagonist, who is a fantastic protagonist. He's not one of those protagonists that is just there to carry forward the story and you don't actually give a shit about. He is a fantastic protagonist. He's so nuanced. He's got so much depth to him. He feels so real. He's very flawed, 
but very lovable and you you root for him and you care for him even when he's being a bit of an ass even when he has some questionable principles that you would expect from a man of his time he's just very easy to root for also we have guy of molten who is the only other character recurring character that i believe is in all seven books and guy of molten is uh, a physician he was a monk in the first book and he is a physician and he is basically um the one that that matthew shardlake turns to most for counsel for wisdom and for medical reasons because he's a physician and he is a fantastic character he talks about medical practices from the time so if you are interested in historical practices it is very intelligently written because again as i've said a million times it has some contemporary values while simultaneously it very much reads a product of its time and i think that's fantastic um, and then the other characters that we have as of book two, we have Jack Barrack, who is one of my favorite characters. He is absolutely amazing. He basically is like a more realistic version of the Artful Dodger. <laughs> like he's just one of those, he's like a real cheap, cheeky chappy. Like you can tell he's just a proper cockney and he's, you know, he's very laid back. He's very cheeky. Um, and he's a bit of a naughty boy and then he, you know, eventually obviously he does grow up with the series because the series takes place over a course of a decade, but it's a really cool way to go about it. Uh, Jack's wife, who I won't mention in case you do want to read this because I'll keep it spoiler free, but Jack's wife who comes in farther down the line is also absolutely awesome. And um, we also get an assistant for um, Shardlake further down the line as well, well, a clerk actually, whose name is Nicholas, who I also really like because he brings in a duality. So you have uh, Jack, who is from a more modest background. He's definitely from the poorer end. He, you know, is he's a rough and tumble kind of guy and then you have jack who comes from gentry background he's a disinherited gentleman so you have kind of that that clash which is very reminiscent of the entire series because you have religious clashes you have political clashes and you have class clashes that's harder to say than i thought it would be um and you have jack and nicholas to embody that and i think that it is incredibly well done so yeah, the cast of characters, we also get the people that work in the house of Joan, who I absolutely love. We also get um, ja Jacqueline later on. Um, yeah, we just, you have a beautiful cast of characters that you grow to care about. And in a way, that's what makes it more terrifying is you have this, this collection of fictional characters that because they're not part of real history, anything can happen to them. And that is terrifying. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I just, I had a fantastic time with this series from the messages and principles that the entire series upheld. The historical accuracy in here is absolutely phenomenal. The historical notes at the end of the books, if you are into history at all, are absolutely brilliant. Everything felt so authentic and immersive. I could not pick up on a single fault with it. Um, and then obviously, as I said, the characters and the plot are just absolutely fantastic so compelling so easy to root for and so easy to get through these books even though they are massive so yes if you are interested in historical fiction and this video hasn't convinced you then i don't know what will <laughs> but if you are getting into historical fiction and you want to read a series that upholds modern values and isn't hiding behind being historical fiction to literally just be the glorification of old white men then this is a series for you i i really do recommend this in terms of just a much more varied outlook on historical fiction um and yeah that that's it that's it for this review because there is nothing left i can say that can convince you that i haven't already said in the 20 odd minutes that i have been filming but that is it from me for today thank you so so much for watching and please tell me if you pick up this series i'd love to chat to you about it um also let me know in the comments down below which other historical fictions in view of this review you think i would enjoy if you enjoy historical fiction um let me know in the comments down below and while you're down there don't forget to like if you like this video subscribe if you've not already hit the bell icon if you want to get notified every time i post a new video in the description box you'll find links to my twitter instagram and goodreads as well as my blog and also all of the bookish stuff related to the for sff State book club which is a book club that i host with my friends kayla ellen and victoria who are linked down there as well as the discord and the twitter for the book club which is a book club dedicated specifically to reading for uh, reading sff books uh, by women and non-binary authors. 
that is all for me for today though guys bye